As we continue our year of programming on the theme of freedom and truth, I would like to begin by reciting the blessing offered by Pope John Paul II at the beginning of Veritatis Splendor. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the splendor of truth shines forth in the, all the works of the Creator, and in a special way in man, created in the image and likeness of God. Truth enlightens man's intelligence and shapes his freedom, leading him to know and love the Lord. Hence, the psalmist prays, let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. So tonight's lecture is sponsored by the Center for Law and the Human Person. So let me say a few words about the center and its mission for those of you joining us for the first time. I see a number of familiar faces, but also some new ones. Uh, along with Professor Mark DiGirolami, who is right there, a uh, shout out to Professor DiGirolami, who joined us uh, in January as a faculty member and also as co-director of the center. Um, I, am, I am privileged to serve along with him as co-director. The center is now in its third year of programming, and the mission of the center is to be a central resource for the law school in connecting the Catholic intellectual tradition, and in particular, its commitments to ideals such as the dignity of the human person, to the study and the teaching and the practice of law. And so to further that mission, we do all sorts of activities like book groups for students, uh, fellowship opportunities, retreats for students, uh, but also public lectures like this evening um, uh, and, and supporting research, et cetera. So we're, we're at the beginning of our, our history and you know the, the sky is the limit, as they say. Outside, we have brochures about the center, so I want to show you a little bit of um, our swag. So you can pick up our brochure to learn more about our activities, to find our website address. We also have bookmarks because followers of the Center for Law and the Human Person read books, right? So, um, it, but the, the special feature of the bookmark is it also contains a description um, explaining our logo, uh, which I think is very beautiful. And then if you love our logo as much as I do, you too can have, like all the kids do these days, right? The, the sticker on your phone or computer or whatever. So that's all out at the, at the table. Um, I, I wanna in particular mention in terms of our future programming, our spring symposium which will be held on April 4th. So that's a, um, an all-day symposium. Again, this year our theme is Freedom and Truth, and our speakers will be Carl Truman, who is a professor of ecclesiastical history at Grove City College and author of The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. He will be speaking on freedom and the human person. Uh, Catherine Pakalik, who is an associate professor here at Catholic University uh, on economic thought. She will be giving a lecture on freedom of the family. And finally, Jerry Bradley, who's a professor of law at Notre Dame, will be uh, giving a talk on freedom of the church. So please pencil April 4th or pen, put, put it in pen in your calendar um, and plan uh, to join us. So. I am delighted to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, we at the center have been brainstorming for some time now uh, about how we might host an event focused on the thought of Solzhenitsyn. Uh, the center's associate director is Lewis Brown out there, so there's Lewis, uh, and Bill Rooney, our Lumen Legis Fellow. Uh, we've been kind of maybe for more than a year thinking of ways that we might uh, feature him, and uh, in, in a year in which our programming is focused on truth and freedom, it seemed especially compelling to dedicate an event to the man who urged us to do the one thing each one of us remains free to do, even in totalitarian circumstances, which is to live not by lies. And we could not have secured a better scholar to do so uh, than our own Cardinal alum, Dan Mahoney. Dan, as I uh, learned today, it received his PhD here from Catholic University. Um, he is a professor emeritus of political science at Assumption University, senior fellow at the Claremont Institute, and for the spring 24 semester, visiting professor in the School for Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership at Arizona State University. So thank you for being willing to leave those sunny climes to join us here. Four days of rain. <laughs> <laughs> <Happy to be. laughs> so um, I could go on and on. I'll just mention a couple of things. Um, Professor Mahoney is a senior contributor to Law and Liberty. Uh, he has written a number of books, uh, including ones on Solzhenitsyn. 
Uh, at the request of the Solzhenitsyn family, Professor Mahoney wrote the introductions to the two volumes of his memoir about his 20 years of exile in the West between two milestone, millstones, between two millstones. Um, and his most recent books are The Idol of Our Age, How the Religion of Humanity Subverts Christianity, uh, The Statesman as Thinker, Portraits of Greatness, Courage, and Moderation, and Recovering Politics, Civilization, and the Soul, essays on Pierre Manent and Roger Scruton. So please join me in welcoming Professor Daniel Mahoney. Thank you so much, Professor Kirk. Uh, delightful, delighted to be here. Uh, it's my second time at the CUA Law School in a couple of months. I gave one of the keynote addresses at the Fellowship for Catholic Scholars here in October. I remember it being a very blustery day. A hurricane was coming up the East Coast, so we were all wet. But, uh, and uh, when I was a student here at CUA, the law school was on the other side of campus, and it was not nearly as nice as this place. Very delighted to be at the new law school and to be back at Catholic University. Let me begin by uh, mentioning, uh, I think it's apropos given the remarks and quotation from uh, St. John Paul II, um, two brief anecdotes about the relationship between Solzhenitsyn and Karol Votiva, or John Paul II. Um, they admired each other. And uh, we learn from uh, his Solzhenitsyn's secretary, uh, his last name was Alberti, that when uh, uh, the news broke in uh, the fall of 1978 that the Archbishop of Krakow was about to become the Holy Roman Pontiff, Solzhenitsyn said that this was the greatest geopolitical event in the world since August 1914. At an interview with Yana Sapietz for the BBC Russian service in February 1979, when asked about the Polish Pope, Solzhenitsyn said, words fail me, it's a gift from God. Uh, you can't picture Dostoevsky saying that about the Polish Pope. Uh, he did much like uh, Catholics or Poles. Uh, and uh, another thing that very few people know is on October 15th, 1993, that would be the 15th anniversary of the election of Karol Votiva as uh, Pope, he had one meeting for three hours, and it was with Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And Solzhenitsyn writes about that encounter, altogether friendly, in the second volume of the aforementioned Between Two Millstones. Uh, by the way, Solzhenitsyn, uh, I'm, I, I, I don't want to use up too much of my precious time uh, with biographical detail, but let me say that Solzhenitsyn was born on December 11th, 1918, and he died on August 3rd, 1908, just shy of the age of 90. I think the, the first date is particularly significant because uh, people born 1917 and 1918 were often caused, called by Soviet propaganda and the press, Lenin's children, because they were born after the revolution. They were children of the revolution, and they were expected to reject and repudiate um, the world that uh, inaugura uh, that uh, that was dispensed with by the October Revolution, by the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. Um, and in fact, uh, even though Solzhenitsyn was raised by a very faithful family, his his father died in a hunting accident while his mother was pregnant with him. He was a lieutenant in the Tsarist army. But his, his mother, Taisha, and his aunt Irina, who raised him, were very devout Orthodox, very anti-communist. But by the age of 15 or 16, Solzhenitsyn writes, the, um, the propaganda of, the co communist propaganda, the propaganda of the Bolshevik regime, he said, was so overwhelming. It's all they heard. 
you know, it's what his classmates believe. He said that he uh, joined the Komsomol, the Young Communist League, and he said with great shame, in retrospect, he pulled the crucifix off of his neck. And, uh, and, he, and the Solzhenitsyn later on said, look, uh, if I hadn't been arrested as a captain in the Red Army in February 1945 for indiscreet criticisms of Stalin and letters he had uh, exchanged with a high school friend, he said, he said, I certainly would have become a writer, but he said, who knows, I may have been an ideological hack. So he, uh, in the famous words of the chapter of The Ascent from uh, volume two of the Gulag Archipelago, Solzhenitsyn wrote, bless you prison for having been in my life. And part of that was, I think, the, the fact that one of the reasons for expressing that gratitude for imprisonment was without it, uh, the scales of ideology may not have fallen from his eyes. And um, as Solzhenitsyn, I think, became recognizably Solzhenitsyn as a result of the 11 years between 1945 and 1956, he spent in prison, in camp, and in internal exile. So more, more to say about some of that as we move along. I also want to add that this is a very important uh, year for people interested in Solzhenitsyn because December, or <clears throat> we're in proximity to the 50th anniversary of the original publication of his most famous, perhaps his most important book, The, the Great Gulag Archipelago, which was originally uh, published in Russian, not in Russia, but in Paris by IMCA, YMCA Press, on December 28th, um, uh, 1973. And the three volumes of the Gulag Archipelago were subsequently published in three volumes in English between 1974, early in 1974, all the way through 1978. There's a beautiful new edition from uh, Vintage Classics in London, uh, commemorative 50th anniversary edition with a quite substantive and thoughtful, even gripping, introduction by Solzhenitsyn's widow, Natalia Solzhenitsyn, and also all sorts of additional ancillary material and information. And it's just a beautifully produced volume. Uh, it's not expensive, but you have to pay for shipping to have it uh, cross the pond, as they say. All right, um, let me say, that, that, that's about as much biography you're gonna get. Solzhenitsyn, lived for 20 years in the West. Between 1974 and 1994, he was forcibly exiled from the Soviet Union after the publication of the Gulag Archipelago in the West. The only reason it was published ahead of schedule because one of the women who had clandestinely typed it had disobeyed orders, really, or a sort of a very deep request to burn the copy she kept it because she said, how could she burn this book? And uh, she was overheard speaking on a train by a KGB agent. They got hold of the book. Once the book was in the hands of the Soviet authorities, Solzhenitsyn knew he had to strike. So, so he was in exile in the West for two years in Zurich, Switzerland, where he completed uh, Lenin in Zurich. Uh, just, uh, he was working on part of the Red Wheel dealing with Lenin, and, didn't hurt to be in Zurich for research uh, and writing purposes. And then he spent 18 years in a small village in Vermont, Cavendish, an uh, ostentatious home, but he had a good um, 18 years to finish his other great masterpiece, The Red Wheel, his work of literary and dramatized history about the coming of the, the Revolution of 1917. It's 10 volumes, 6,000 pages. Believe it or not, just wonderful. He considered it to be his greatest work, but it, uh, of course, uh, takes time and effort and commitment to make your way through. But the, uh, the scenes of the revolutions of 1917, the gripping street scenes, are really worth the price of admission. And uh, Solzhenitsyn's argument, of course, is that the 
uh, the February Revolution of 1917, which brought democracy to Russia, was the source of the problem because it destroyed all power structures. It led weak and ineffectual liberals and socialists power to power, governing for, as he put it, minus two days. And as Trotsky said in one of his memoirs, uh, the, the Bolsheviks coming to power in the fall of 1917 was as easy as lifting a pen. So rather than celebrating the overthrow of the Tsarist regime, for all its limits and all its imperfections, Solzhenitsyn saw its overthrow as calamitous. All right, so um, I think Solzhenitsyn is undoubtedly one of the great souls of this or any age. I think the classical term magnanimity, greatness of soul, comes to mind. In the words of his famous memoir, he is the pugnacious calf who budded and tried to fell the totalitarian oak, which was the Soviet state. The first of his memoirs is entitled The Oak and the Calf, and that title comes from a Russian proverb about a little calf budding the oak. He is the little calf, and the totalitarian state is the oak. Solzhenitsyn uses a lot of these old Russian proverbs and to, to great effect in, his, in both his publicistic works and his literary works. As the distinguished Franco-Swiss Solzhenitsyn scholar Georges Niva has put it, Solzhenitsyn was once a writer and a fighter, one who fought evil with cunning and tenacity while chronicling the totalitarian assault on the human spirit and reflecting deeply on what it means to be a human being. He was at once a gifted writer, winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1970, a moral witness to those who perished at the hands of an inhuman ideology. And it was an inhuman ideology. I jokingly say that when I first started teaching, my students thought communism was good in theory, but bad in practice. Now a lot of them think it's uh, good in theory and not so bad in practice rather than seeing it for the utter abomination that it was. And Solzhenitsyn was also a historian of the Russian Revolution and the Soviet tragedy more broadly. But like Dostoevsky, there's a philosophical dimension to Solzhenitsyn's work. Why? Because he never lost sight of the enduring drama of good and evil in the human soul. If you read nothing else by Solzhenitsyn, I recommend the fourth of the seven parts of the Gulag Archipelago. This would be volume two, or it would be in the uh, middle section of the authorized abridgment, and it's the section entitled The Soul at Barbed Wire. It begins with a quote from 1 Corinthians. Um, Let me show you a mystery. We shall not die, but we shall all be changed. And it's about not only his, but the possibility of spiritual ascent and transformation despite the cruelties of the camps, despite the pressures emanating from a truly inhuman ideology. Um, what I'm going to do for the remainder of my time is highlight several themes of Solzhenitsyn related to the theme of the connection between freedom and truth, and also the connection that Solzhenitsyn sketches between freedom, self-limitation, one of his, or self-restriction, one of his favorite notions and phrases, and the affirmation, the recognition or acknowledgement of moral purpose. Um, it's my deep conviction that Solzhenitsyn's wisdom will endure, has the subtitle of my talk, and will inspire countless generations of readers in the future. And an important caveat, 
I think Solzhenitsyn should not be hastily reduced to a mere chronicler of a monstrous but passing ideology. In other words, yesterday's news. Anyone who read Solzhenitsyn that way, I think, was missing the point. You know, there's, uh, I think it's page 75 of the first five of the Gulag Archipelago, Solzhenitsyn says, if you think this book is just a political indictment, slam its covers shut right now. Now, it is the most important political indictment ever written about a political regime, as George Kennan said in his New York Times Sunday book review of the Gulag Archipelago, a Washington Post book review of the Gulag Archipelago in 1974, but it's much more than that. Um, so one aspect of Solzhenitsyn's activity was, you know, Solzhenitsyn was the St. George slaying the dragon of ideology. But the book, the Gulag Archipelago in particular, is a search for truth, for self-knowledge, and for understanding of the, the sparks of the spirit that no ideology or oppressive political order, totalitarian political order, can negate. Um, so, um, in the, uh, um, the soul and barbed wire, uh, the section I've already mentioned is really gets to the heart and soul of Solzhenitsyn's message, and particularly the message of the Gulag Archipelago, because it highlights, I think in a dramatic way, beautifully written, uh, uh, but it conveys to those who could never experience the suffering and the pressures of the camps, the terrible and consequential choice faced by, the Russians call them zeks, it was short for prisoner, uh, gulag prisoners in the camps. And Solzhenitsyn said that decision really came down to whether one was to maintain one's moral integrity, or as he put it, one is willing to survive at any price. Um, and by the way, I think it's fair to say that most modern moral, legal, philosophical doctrines do not really give us a good, good reasons why we should choose not to survive at any price. You know, most modern uh, philosophical doctrines center around some version of self-preservation or human autonomy. But to say there are some things a human cannot do without losing his or her soul, his or her moral countenance, is a very, a profoundly countercultural message. Um, and this section of the Gulag Archipelago chronicles, among other things, the profound effects of a system rooted in violence and lies on those who lived even in free Soviet society. In other words, people who were not arrested, but faced all the constraints of what Solzhenitsyn called in a particularly uh, uh, important chapter, Our Muzzled Freedom. Uh, how free was free Soviet life in the Lenin and Soviet periods? Not, not very free. Solzhenitsyn speaks about a betrayal as a form of existence and mendacity or lying as a form of existence. Um, so Solzhenitsyn does a wonderful job, I think, of conveying the, the fact that human beings are still charged to maintain their personal integrity in the camps or outside of the camps. It's still possible for a human being to maintain his human countenance despite omnipresent political oppression and pressure. Um, so here's a quotation. Uh, this is from a book called Russia in Collapse from 1998. It never came out in English, although there are, I would say, significant uh, excerpts in the Solzhenitsyn reader that I co-edited with Edward uh, E. Erickson, Jr. 
And I think this, this quotation I'm about to read you gets to the heart and soul of the, uh, the, the, the section that I've referred to entitled The Soul and Barbed Wire. The Bolsheviks, for their part, Bolsheviks, by the way, for you younger people, just as another term for the communists, there was a split in a party congress in 1903, and very momentarily, the Bolsheviks had a majority, even though they were usually the minority, and Bolsheviki means the majority faction. And it was sort of a Lenin decided, well, call our sides of the majority, even if there were 40,000 of us in, in January 1917 in the whole of the uh, Russian Empire. The Bolsheviks, for their part, quickly put the Russian character in irons and redirected it to their own ends. This was not an ordinary political regime, authoritarian regime. I will recapitulate briefly. A paralyzing fear spread over the country, a fear not only of arrest, but if any action of the leadership, given the total and utter worthlessness of anyone's rights and the inability to escape from arbitrary rule by relocating. The Soviets right up to the middle to late 80s had internal passports. You couldn't move or travel throughout the country without your movement or your decision to accept a new job or relocate being approved by the party and the Soviet regime. A network of informants saturated the population. Secrecy and distrust permeated the people, so much so that any overt activity was perceived as provocation. How many denunciations there were against one's own close relatives or against friends who had fallen under the sword. A total deafening indifference toward those who perished all around. An overwhelming plume of betrayal. It was unavoidable. If you want to survive, lie, lie and pretend. In place of all the good that was dying away, ingratitude, cruelty, and a thoroughly rude self-centered ambition now arose and established themselves. So I'd suggest that only a great writer could describe these deeply perverse effects of totalitarianism on the human world with such precision, directness, and moral acuity. Um, we have to remember that, uh, and you know, the students of the Soviet order debate the, what I might, uh, uh, euphemistically called the demographic consequences of Soviet communism. The authors of the Black Book of Communism, edited by Stefan Courtois, published in Paris in 1998, available, book is available from Harvard University Press, estimate that the Soviet regime under Lenin and Stalin was responsible for the deaths of t at least 20 million, 20 million unnatural deaths Alexander Yakovlev, who was the head of the official commission on um, political repression under Lenin and Stalin, under both Yeltsin and Putin, estimates that 35 million people fell victims to the Soviet regime. But I think we can get preoccupied with the political demography or the death count because I think the great students of totalitarianism rightly insist that um, totalitarianism was as much an assault on the soul as it was on the human body. And, um, and I think what Solzhenitsyn's work brings out with per particular brilliance is, well, one would expect almost everyone to succumb to the pressures of a state where the gulag is a cancer metastasizing throughout the body politic, where mendacity and betrayal are systematized. People think about systematic this and that today. Well, this is systematic betrayal and systematic mendacity. Uh, uh, but yet, Solzhenitsyn says, it wasn't just a few people 
who somehow managed to retain their humanity, their human countenance. Uh, a disproportionate number of those who maintain their personal integrity were religious believers. So the Gulag Solzhenitsyn tells a wonderful, he has a wonderful comparison in volume one between Nicholas Bukharin, who was, uh, uh, oh, a slightly less fanatical Leninist than Trotsky and Stalin, who was one of the old Bolsheviks who was put on trial and eventually executed by the Soviet state, 1936, 1937. But Bukharin and the other old Bolsheviks did not really do very well under torture. And they really didn't stand up to, uh, uh, the, the, uh, to the pressures emanating from the Soviet regime. Solzhenitsyn speculates that they had, and this is his phrase, they had no independent point of view. Because if they had accepted communism as a justification for revolution, for the substitution of decency and moral life by a revolutionary ethos, etc., how could they say, well, in my case, it's wrong, you know? He said because they had no independent point of view, they could not really say no to the inhuman. He compares a little orthodox lady who... Uh, is arrested because she knows where an underground movement is hiding an orthodox archbishop who eventually made his way to Finland. And he says, this little old lady says, so, you guys are pathetic. You're scared of me. You want to kill me, but you can't kill me because I know. He says, I don't care if you kill me. I, I, I trust the truth. I'm committed to my uh, moral integrity and honor, and I believe in God. So the simple peasant woman he says, had an implacable uh, point of view, you know? And that's what one needs, an independent point of view that is not reducible to some ideological imperative or historical movement, you know? And that recovery of the, uh, you might say, the, the integrity of the soul when confronted by the lie, I think, is something at the heart and soul of Solzhenitsyn's work. And the interesting thing about the last book and a half of the Gulag Archipelago, so that would be The Soul of Barbed Wire, and then all of I Am Three is, Solzhenitsyn goes out of his way to highlight heroic and courageous resistance to the totalitarian lie. Not just people in the camps, his, his soul. Jailmate at the Liubanka in 1945, Arnold Susi, a former minister of education in uh, Estonia. And he says he was a decent man when he came into the camps and he was a decent man when he left. And he said, you couldn't get him to betray anyone. You couldn't get him to repeat mendacious slogans, you know. By the way, Solzhenitsyn wrote the Gulag Archipelago mainly over two long winters in 1965 and 1966 hiding in the forests of Estonia in a cabin owned by Arnold Susi and his wife. And he really escaped the attention of the KGB for like six months. They didn't know where he was. He was this, this, uh, this utterly decent man who Solzhenitsyn puts forward as an example of a man of integrity who could never be ground down by the ideological lie or the totalitarian state. But there's also accounts of, of, of gulag revolts at Agabastus in 1952, at Kengir, a beautiful chapter called The 40 Days at Kengir. The prisoners rose up against the totalitarian state. They took control of it for 40 days. It was eventually crushed by tanks. Solzhenitsyn wrote a play version of the chapter from the gulag called 40 Days at Kengir, called The Tanks Know the Truth. But 8,000 prisoners, criminals and politicals, united. And Solzhenitsyn has a, um, a passing line or two where he says they elected leaders and a democratic council. And he says, for the first time in the 20th century, Russians saw self-government. They saw it in Kengir when the prisoners who emancipated themselves, however briefly, from official Soviet control. So my, my 
Latter remarks have really emphasized, I think, the positive alternative, the positive affirmation that Solzhenitsyn begins to articulate in the Gulag Archipelago. And that positive affirmation is not simply a negative critique of totalitarian evil, but a positive reaffirmation of what we might call the great drama of good and evil in every human soul. Uh, let me begin this brief section with a quotation from a 1993 uh, interview that Solzhenitsyn did with a German newspaper. Um, and I quote, I am most unlike Rousseau in my views. Claiming that humans are good his, by nature, but corrupted by their environment and circumstances was a grave error. I have always said many times that the line between good and evil is not drawn between governments, parties, or nations, but through every human heart. A human being is inclined to both good and evil. And in that uh, quotation from the 1993 interview with the German press, readers of Gulag Archipelago will recognize certain uh, formulations that are expressed, I think, in a more literary and powerful way. But same thought in two chapters of the Gulag Archipelago, the Blue Caps from volume one and the Ascent from volume two. Um, and I think this is where Solzhenitsyn's work takes on a great and enduring character, the deepest lesson of the totalitarian episode for Solzhenitsyn is um, the limits, the radical limits and the evil inherent in an ideological Manichaeanism uh, that reduces evil, localizes evil, in certain groups who are said to embody the whole of evil. If only we get rid of the Jews, as the Nazis said, or the class enemy, as the communists said, uh, or the Christians, as atheistic Bolsheviks said, or you know those who have the right, wrong pigmentation of their skin, as various racist and contemporary racialists say. Well, Solzhenitsyn thought that that mode of thinking was essentially tyrannical, essentially totalitarian, essentially eliminationist. So you might say the great anthropological insight, it's a very simple insight, but one with profound consequences, precisely that the line dividing good and evil runs through every human heart. As Solzhenitsyn says at one point in the Gulag Archipelago, we cannot excise evil from the world. And if we attempt to do so, as these ideological fanatics and Manichaeans do, we will simply exacerbate evil. We, we, will, uh, we will increase its foothold in the human polit and political world and in the human soul in the very attempt to excise it. But we can learn how to restrict it. And we can learn how to restrict it by cultivating the moral virtues, by refusing the ideological lie, and by rejecting any ideological or political temptation to, as I said a moment ago, to localize evil in suspect groups or to be eliminated or canceled or shunned in an effort to cre create some kind of kingdom of heaven on earth. Now, at the end of his luminous Templeton address, the Templeton Fund, I think they still give out a Templeton Prize, but it's a raison d'etre, its contours have changed a bit over the years. But when Solzhenitsyn got it, it was called the Templeton Prize for Progress in Religion. I'm not quite sure what progress in religion is. And I'm not sure Solzhenitsyn knew exactly what he was. He was a bit puzzled as he discusses the matter in uh, Between Two Mostos. But in any case, um, the more money comes within the, the Nobel Prize, in case you, you're running 
uh, campaigning for the temples of Christ. Now, the, uh, da the Dalai Lama, Mother Teresa, and uh, many worthies have received the Templeton Prize. My, my old friend Michael Novak received the Templeton Prize. Uh, so his speech in London accompanying this prize given in recognition of progress in religion, Solzhenitsyn reiterates one of his most important themes, quote, that the primary key um, to our being or non-being resides in each individual human heart in the heart's specific a preference for specific good or evil. But Solzhenitsyn adds that many in the Western world have succumbed to their own version of the ideological lie, believing in an untenable ideology of indefinite progress. And in other words, to accept the palpable reality of the drama of good and evil in every human heart is not to reject progress in some circumscribed technical or social sense, but it is certainly to reject the idea that human beings can, without the grace of God, overcome evil in this world uh, only with uh, the exercise of the free will of human beings. Uh, he has, Solzhenitsyn always said, our free will is bestowed by the Most High. But he says, we have to use our freedom. We have to redirect our freedom. Uh, it, uh, uh, redirect its consciousness in repentance to the creator of all. Freedom disinterred from justice and conscience some kind of, you know, dream of pure autonomy. It's, it's a self-deification, Solzhenitsyn argued, that leads to self-enslavement. And so um, for Solzhenitsyn, freedom always needed to be accompanied by repentance, by moral self-knowledge, and what Solzhenitsyn called moral voluntary self-limitation. If freedom is to be conducive of something truly worthy of human beings. Uh, just a couple of minutes more of remarks, and I will conclude. Since I'm speaking at a law school, I don't know how many people here are students of the law or law professors, I thought I might end by highlighting some remarks that Solzhenitsyn delivered during his Western uh, uh, during his Western Island, uh, uh, excuse me, exile to the Freedoms Foundation in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. And the theme of this talk, this is what Solzhenitsyn, uh, you might say the, uh, the bien pensant, the intellectual class sound on Solzhenitsyn when they began to see that his alternative to communist totalitarianism was not simply of an endorsement of Western hedonism or autonomy or freedom, divorce from the precious categories of, of uh, repentance and self-limitation. Uh, just one second. In any case, in this address that I'm about to cite, um, Solzhenitsyn uh, discusses two kinds of freedom exterior and interior. And his argument is that in the contemporary Western world, most people understand freedom to simply mean exterior freedom, the freedom to do what we will. And so Zenitsyn suggested that while there is something important and I would say even vitally important about such an ex exterior freedom, by itself and without, you might say, some directedness toward truth and some directedness toward the goods of the human soul, exter exterior freedom can quickly degenerate into something uh, ugly, something unworthy of human beings. It's quite interesting in the uh, 
in the Gulag, Arch uh, in the Gulag Archipelago, Solzhenitsyn takes on Leo Tolstoy. Leo, Leo Tolstoy, I don't mean the author of Anna Karenina uh, and War and Peace, but I mean the, the religious prophet, the pacifist, the Gandhi of all the lettres. He was a bit of a lure. And, uh, but he said political freedom didn't matter at all. Well, Solzhenitsyn has a, a, a wonderful chapter in the third volume of the Gulag Archipelago where he says, well, Tolstoy could say that because he was a world celebrity living it in perfect privilege and wealth at Yisnaya Poliana, even as the prophet of a new kind of Rousseauist Christianity. But he said if he had been blockaded like we had all been, if he had been sent to the camps, if he had been treated the way Akhmatova or Pasternak was, he too would say exterior freedom is important. It's important. But Solzhenitsyn makes clear in the 1976 speech I alluded to, the shallowing of freedom, that ex external freedom, however important, cannot be a self-contained end for human beings and societies, but only a means that facilitates our undistorted development. Only a chance, and he italicizes the word chance, for us to live a human and not an animal existence. And it's quite interesting, at the end of the speech, Solzhenitsyn says, it's not advisable or desirable to simply conflate and collapse legal and moral criteria. But he said, it's also not worthy of the human spirit or the nature of things to understand the legal as the simply moral. In other words, genuine human freedom entails a God-given inner freedom. And that means that legal justifications or actions are hard, hardly exhaust a full, noble, expansive understanding of what the human per person is. Um, uh, so I quote uh, Solzhenitsyn, the person who truly understands freedom is not the one who hurries to cash in on his legal rights, that but one whose conscience constrains him even in the face of legal justification, not the one who hastens to win a sure court case but the one with the nobleness to forego it, and moreover, to make public his own mistakes or misdeeds, that which used to be called by the ancient and now peculiar word, honor. So Solzhenitsyn raises an important question about whether legal criteria can do full justice to inner freedom, to the fullness of moral criteria, and whether moral criteria themselves can raise up to the level of true, capacious, and efficacious honor, personal and collective. And it's interesting, after giving uh, the, Americans, the Americans a little lecture on our excessive legalism and our tendency to reduce the legal, uh, the moral to the legal and, uh, and freedom to self-will, Solzhenitsyn ends uh, and, and, and repeating and developing his wonderful theme of voluntary self-limitation and full acceptance and consciousness of pers personal responsibility, he ends on a positive note. Yet I have profound faith in the soundness and health of the roots of the magnanimous and mighty American nation with the painstaking honesty of its youth and its ever alert moral awareness. I have seen rural and small town America with my own eyes, and that is precisely why with steady hope I express all this here today. So speaking of the American people, social needs and notice that confidence not in the professors at Harvard or the intellectual class that denounced his Harvard address, but at the ordinary folk who represent the magnanimous and mighty American nation at its very best. Thank you.
uh, my question has to do with you started the talk by invoking magnanimity. You're ending the talk. I started the talk with what? Magnanimity, like magnanimous. Sure, sure. And then you hit it again at the end, and then with hope, based on like this notion of self-limitation, this reality of hope, but also in these totalitarian regimes where there could be a false hope. Could you break open like the role of hope in the the vision that Solzhenitsyn has? And in how we might be able to wrestle with the necessity of hope, you know? Yeah, no, uh, that's a one. That's a wonderful question or request on your part. Um, Solzhenitsyn once described himself in an interview with Joseph Pierce as a pessimistic optimist. In other words, there were many things around him in his own life that may have given him reason for pessimism, maybe even despair. But Solzhenitsyn never despaired. He says in his Nobel lecture that he's absolutely convinced of the primacy of the good, the, the, that the foundations of the world are, are lay in a, you know, a provident God and a bountiful natural order of things. And so all the years in the uh, camps did not dissuade him of that conviction. It reinforced it. But I think hope, uh, as I think everyone in this room probably appreciates, is something very distinct from facile secular optimism. In other words, Solzhenitsyn was not an optimist. He never thought we would leave behind the drama of good and evil in human souls. He knew that the worst was always possible. He had faced the monster of ideological fanaticism up front. But he had confidence, you might say, that the human soul is created by a benevolent God uh, uh, the virtues attendant to our nature and a well-developed character. Um, and notice, it's not just the Aristotelian virtues Solzhenitsyn nods to, but it's also a Christian notion of repentance. I think so much of Solzhenitsyn's personal bearing, his thought, uh, what he defended, what he articulated in both his bellatristic and publicistic writings is a reflection of this really splendid and in some ways original mating and mixing of magnanimity and humility. Thomas Aquinas says magnanimity and humility only are only apparently in contradiction. But when Solzhenitsyn talks about magnanimity, he never means some kind of self-assertion where the you know a person who embodies magnanimity is self-sufficient unto himself. But it's a, a kind of appeal to honor, to a moral integrity that ultimately depends on humility, a recognition of an order of things that transcends, to use a phrase I used earlier, self-will. So one could unpack this, and I tried to do this in uh, two of my books on Solzhenitsyn to show that, you know, Solzhenitsyn, again, these were not things he studied at the School of Philosophy at the Catholic University of America, alas. But these were things that I think he came to know, partly through his reading uh, uh, later in life, but mainly through personal experience in the camps that he, uh, uh, he learned the effectual truth, you might say, of a classical Christian understanding of hope, moral responsibility, the virtue, self-limitation, etc. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming to speak. Excellent talk. Could you um, speak up just a little bit? Uh, thank you for coming to speak. Excellent talk. I just uh, wanted to hear that again. Oh, know? sure. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so, obviously, I think uh, Solzhenitsyn is, and his faith are, are totally united. His works and his faith are totally united in his understanding of the human person. And his, What was that about being... Uh, his, his work, uh, discussing the human person, and his understanding of faith are totally united. Um, and they come to a head in the Gulag Archipelago and also, I think, in One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, which is a great parallel to Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. They're very similar in the cultivation of an interior life. Um, so my question is, um, is there room for the effect of grace in his understanding of mankind's action? Or does it come down to more of an internal virtue that is allowed by God? Um, or, or, or is he dependent on grace for human things? So, uh, 
just the last two parts of your remark. You want to know if it all comes down to grace? Yes. No, I think not. I think, um, I think Solzhenitsyn would say something like this. Nothing in the end is possible without grace, but Solzhenitsyn is very convinced of the reality and efficacy of free will. So um, I think he would, he would not want to say that we just, we just depend on the gratuitous goodness of God and wait for things to happen. He hated that kind of passivity, which he thought, he, you know, for example, in Red the Red Wheel, he's very critical of Tolstoy because he says Tolstoy preached a religion of passivity and pacifism. You know, he says, look at Nicholas II, you know, it's really very good family man, decent man, but a horrible czar because he had no capacity to act. Uh, no capacity to fight evil, no capacity to stand up for the nation. Um, and uh, you mentioned one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich. Well, I'm sure as you remember, that great little novella ends with a dialogue between Alyoshka the Baptist and Ivan Denisovich Shukov. Ivan Denisovich is a peasant, superstitious. I mean, he's baptized, and probably thinks he's orthodox, but, you know, when Alyoshka quotes the famous biblical verse about, you know, <laughs> about uh, uh, faith moving mountains, he said, I never saw a mountain move. And you know, he's, very, he's very literal in his understanding of things, but he's cutting. He knows how to survive, and whether, you know, how he hides things and saves his tobacco, and how he organizes the work team, but he's thoroughly decent. He has a, a kind of matus, to use the Greek name, you know, that, that practical cunning or prudence, but never at the expense of other human beings. And yet, if you look at the dialogue, Alyoshka the Baptist is got a sentence of 25 years just because he's a Baptist. So Zanetsin clearly admired the Baptist prisoners, but they were very passive, and they really thought, imprisonment doesn't really matter to us. God's looking out for it. What matters is getting rid of the, the soot and our heart and soul. And uh, Ivan Denisovich says, no, we, we don't deserve to be here. This is an unjust regime. And so it's pretty clear to me that despite his admiration for the steadfastness uh, and the deep religiosity of Alyoshka, Solzhenitsyn is closer to Ivan Denisovich that this kind of political order needs to be resisted. People like Ivan Denisovich, by the way, is in prison for 10 years for having been caught by the Germans. The sheer fact of being arrested by the Germans on the front in 1941 or 42 meant he was sympathetic to the Germans. He actually escaped from the Germans, and then he was about a ten tenor, as they call it, and was sent to the camp. So it's a very interesting exchange, and it's an interesting exchange for some of the reasons I just delineated, but it's also an interesting exchange because Solzhenitsyn sides, if he sides, with the non-believer over the believer. There's just something too accepting of fate. There's an absence of free will. Uh, I, you know, if some of it comes back, well, you know, when the Lord says, resist ye not evil, does he mean just accept everything that happens? Or um, do we have an obligation to resist a political order that threatens the very integrity of the human soul? And I think that was Solzhenitsyn's view. Politics is not the highest or more important thing, but without a certain amount of external freedom, and especially in a totalitarian context, the danger is the human soul will be suffocated altogether. So it's, a, it's just like the, the, the question about, you know, conjugating hope and magnanimity. This is a really interesting issue, too, because you can certainly find proof texts in Solzhenitsyn that seem to privilege interior freedom and exterior freedom. But both are important, and I would say both have to be thought about dialectically. And uh, if you just read the Soul and Barbed Wire, Bless You Prison for Having Been in My Life, you might say, ah, Solzhenitsyn is uh, highlighting redemptive suffering. Uh, but then 
the third book of the Gulag. It's a tribute to active forms of resistance, including armed resistance. And so again, there's that tension, I think, between um, two forms of spiritedness. I might say the soul ascending in light of the drama of good and evil and the grace of God, but also active resistance of evil for the sake of the common good and for the sake of human communities where human beings can live and breathe freely. Thank you.